Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we'll be discussing fasciolysis, an infection caused by fasciola hepatica, the liver fluke. The distribution for fasciola hepatica is the same as you would find for the distribution of sheep raising throughout the world. It's often called the sheep liver fluke because the sheep can serve as a reservoir host for the infection as well and primarily is the dominant animal that's infected by fasciola hepatica. As we'll see, uh, the way in which sheep are raised, their need for water, and the growth of certain plants along the edge of these watering places uh, fosters the cycle. It's an old infection. It's, it was known as far back as Reddy, which is considered one of the um, great um, scientists of his day. And uh, as you will recall, I celebrated Reddy by uh, pointing out the fact that he was the one that actually wrote about the scientific control. So if you do something to something, let's say you change the temperature or the change the humidity of something to see if it had an effect on the growth of, of a plant or, or even the, the comfort, comfort zone of an animal, you have to leave it the same by comparison if you want to know what the difference is. And prior to that, nobody actually understood that um, approach to discovering knowledge about the way the world works. But it was Reddy who actually um, championed that approach. He also described a number of different um, entities in life, and, and among them were a variety of parasites, and included in that list is Fasciola hepatica. Now, I'm not sure if he knew Linnaeus, and I don't think they actually lived at the same time, but Linnaeus picked up on the fact that this worm had been discovered and described and gave it its official name of Fasciola hepatica. Sometime much later on then, uh, Leuchart, uh, the same person who did a lot of work on the Trichinella spiralis worm that we talked about earlier, worked out all of the details of the life cycle of Fasciola hepatica and became a champion for the control of this parasite throughout Europe. The life cycle of Fasciola hepatica does not differ um, significantly from all of the other trematodes that we've discovered so far. It involves a snail intermediate host and a warm-blooded mammalian host. So let's begin with the warm-blooded mammalian host, namely either us or the sheep as the reservoir. The metasicaria, instead of now forming under the scale of a fish or perhaps avoiding that stage altogether and just swimming about as a sicaria, the metasicaria for fasciola actually insists on vegetation and primarily vegetation that grows along the edges of standing bodies of water. So these standing bodies of water are created by sheep farmers that, for lack of a better um, uh, way of describing this, they need to provide grass and water for their sheep. And basically that's it. And in doing so, they create these aquatic environments that foster the development of this infection. And very often, the, um, the shepherd of his flock also acquires the infection the same way that the sheep do, namely by eating a portion of this vegetation that is not cooked. And in, in most cases, it turns out to be some form of watercress. And watercress is a, an adornment on various other dishes of cuisine, and it could be used as a, a lettuce substitute, for instance. You can have what is uh, referred to in polite society as watercress sandwiches. And I know that's rather popular among certain um, people in certain places. But remember, it's got one of these little metasicarias sitting on a leaf, perhaps, which could result in a full-blown infection of a very, very large parasite. So what happens after the ingestion of the metasicaria is that the meal is ingested, the acellular layer on the outside that protects the metasicaria from environmental changes and damages is digested away. The immature worm then is released, and now there's an interesting difference. This parasite then penetrates the small intestine. 
and migrates up into the liver tissue from the outside. It actually does so in the peritoneal cavity of the, of the uh, infected host. It, it penetrates liver tissue and at that point begins to grow. As it begins to grow, of course, <clears throat> it needs to eat. And the food that it eats is our liver tissue. And it actually stimulates the growth of liver tissue by secreting proline into the environment. And proline, an amino acid um, which we all have as part of our own protein structure, is if it's secreted in high amounts, actually uh, causes a hyperplasia of the local tissue. And so the parasite basically fertilizes its own lawn and then goes ahead and mows it, if you wanted to think of it by analogy. So the parasites live in liver tissue, and they don't stay put. They start to migrate. And these are very large organisms. I would indicate the size of one with my hand right now, as you can see. The inner space that I'm indicating here is about the size of a typical fasciola hepatica worm. It creates tunnels throughout the liver tissue, which obviously can't be a good thing. And in doing so, it secretes eggs. They're self-fertilizing, by the way, so fasciola are hermaphrodites, as Clonorchis was as well. And the eggs are then passed through the liver tissue, through the bile duct, out into the small intestine, and eventually are extruded uh, in the fecal event to the freshwater environment. Now, you can imagine how this could occur in uh, sheep uh, raising, where sheep gather in large groups to ag obtain water, and as long as they're there, they might as well eat some watercress. And in doing so, of course, they defecate. So they do all three things in the same place. Now, granted, sheep farmers don't, but nonetheless, if they are in the habit of collecting a portion of this uh, plant life for their own home consumption, that's where the problems start. <clears throat> the eggs then hatch in uh, fresh water, releasing the myricidium, very typical trematode life cycle. Myricidium then penetrates the foot of the snail, undergoes a multiplication events inside the snail tissue, and eventually out come the saccharii that swim towards the shore of lakes, encounter vegetation, they attach to the leaf of a, of a plant of various sorts, the tail drops off, they secrete their hard environment, a uh, hard uh, um, shell rather, to resist the uh, changing environment that is very typical for these bodies of water. And they can last for months at a time without losing their viability. So that's the basic life cycle for fasciola hepatica. So um, just shown here are some of the actual stages of the parasite uh, in real life. So the egg is very characteristic, containing uh, an underdeveloped myricidium. That is to say, it has not undergone its complete embryogenesis as the egg is passed. The egg then must receive uh, sunlight in order to generate uh, the stimulus for the egg to go on to become embryonated. The embryonation event then results in the formation of the myricidium. Myricidium, when completed, then breaks out of the egg, seeks a snail host, infects it, eventually produces the saccharia. The saccharia round up on the plant life as metasaccharia, and eventually, when swallowed, uh, will result in the formation of this very large adult worm. As I mentioned, sheep are the reservoir hosts. And now Dr. Daniel Griffin is going to give a clinical vignette illustrating the pathogenesis of this infection. A 53-year-old woman who is visiting the United States from Bolivia comes in with intense belly pain in the right upper part of her belly. She has become a strict vegetarian after being diagnosed with breast cancer and is currently on a raw vegetable diet to improve her health. She felt this was really helping her immune system. Now she's not feeling so well. Uh, she reports that her breast cancer was a recent diagnosis uh, with localized disease treated without adjuvant therapy. So she just had a lumpectomy and the lymph node staging in the left um, axilla, so that's the area under the arm. Uh, she does report 
that she comes from an agricultural area in Bolivia where there are sheep. She, however, reports that she avoids the sheep and that she also has a significant fear of dogs. On exam, she has a left lumpectomy scar and an axillary scar. Her right upper quadrant is uh, tender, so the upper right part of the belly is tender, and there's slight liver enlargement. The laboratories are remarkable for an elevated white count with 60% eosinophils, and her liver um, transaminases are normal. Well, let's talk a little bit about clinical disease. Individuals may develop symptoms related to the migration of the immature worms within a month after becoming infected. And by migration, we're actually talking about these worms um, migrating through liver tissue. So the right upper quadrant, uh, liver localized pain. Now, many persons are actually asymptomatic during the early phase, while um, the symptomatic patients might have fever, they might have pain um, in the area of the liver, they might have headache, they might have a generalized uh, malaise, muscle pain, uh, weight loss, and even some can develop urticaria. But eosinophilia is often a prominent feature. Now on imaging, there actually are these radiographic findings on contrast CT that are reported as hypoattenuating tracts. And what these actually are, you're seeing the helminth invasion paths um, through the liver. Now in heavy infections, the liver can become enlarged and tender. Um, and actually you can get um, fluid around the right side of the, the lung, so a right side of pleural effusion with eosinophilia. During the chronic stage of the disease, dull pain and obstruction of the biliary ducts can occur. Now, there are usually no changes in the liver function tests, and jaundice is not a usual finding, but that has been reported, so there's some variability here. Um, the gallbladder may become severely damaged in heavy infections, um, and the fasciola sites other than the liver can cause um, symptoms or no symptoms. It sort of depends. Let's talk a little bit about diagnosis. Uh, the serological tests are going to become positive early in disease while the migration is through the liver parenchyma. And it's important to think about timing and think about how this happens. So this parasite is going to actually penetrate the capsule, Gleason's capsule, get into the liver. It's going to be migrating through. So it still hasn't reached the biliary system. So at this point, you're not going to be able to detect any eggs or anything in the biliary system. So no eggs in the stool. Your ova and parasite test is not going to help you. But serology, um, several weeks in, you're already going to see an immune response. And serological tests can help you early in disease. Antigen tests are also available, so you can actually detect antigens. Um, microscopy. This, you're going to have to wait a little while. You're going to have to wait about four months until you actually start to get eggs released into the feces. Um, again, late in disease endoscopy. Um, you can do, again, this endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. So this is a scope down looking into the biliary system. And late in disease, when the migration has actually reached this level, you can actually visualize the flukes. Um, imaging. Um, early on, you can, on uh, imaging, see these migratory tracts. That, coupled with the right clinical history, epidemiology, and serology can be diagnostic. Um, later on, adult flukes may be observed using ultrasound. CAT scans, MRI, and again, cholangiography. Now, again, late in disease, once you're actually getting these in the stool, you actually can see lay eggs um, in the stool by microscopy. Um, and these are actually pretty large eggs, right? Um, they're going to be about 130, 150 micrometers by about 60 to 90 micrometers wide. Um, here's some images showing you what you might see on um, a CT scan. You can actually see these hypo attenuating, right? So it's lighter in color. Um, you can see an adult here in liver tissue. And here's an ultrasound. And the ultrasound is nice because um, it's actually going to allow you to see any movement that might occur. So you're actually going to have a motility that you can see um, on the moving image of an ultrasound. Uh, what about treatment? Uh, treatment, and th this is one of those pearls. This is not treated with a drug you normally think about in treating our parasitic infection. So triclobendazole um, is then uh, given usually once, but in severe infections, you might want to repeat this um, either 12 or 24 hours later. Uh, you actually need to work through the CDC in the United States to get access to these um, drugs. Uh, successful treated patients usually will convert to negative serologies within 6 to 12 months after they clear their parasite. So there's an ability to check for cure. Uh, triclobendazole. Remember this, this is one of those unique little things to uh, remember 
Don't go throw in albendazole or praziquantel. This is a situation where triclobendazole is the drug of choice. And this is going to work by selectively uh, depolymerizing the worm tubulins. What about our patient? And this is actually an image from our patient. Um, and you can see here that there were uh, streaky liver parenchymal tracts. Uh, she had a serological test that was positive. Uh, she was treated with triclobendazole um, times one, not praziquantel. Um, and about two years later, uh, she actually had serology repeated and it was negative at that time. Preventing and controlling fasciolysis is difficult. It's so difficult that it's still found throughout England, Scotland, Ireland, New Zealand, places where lots of sheep are raised and people are well-educated. Uh, the standard of living is really high. It has nothing to do with being a disadvantaged population. It has something to do with the eating habits of people that live in these areas. So to prevent and control fasciolysis, Certainly, we start with sanitary disposal of feces, but we also have to educate the people who are raising the sheep to begin with. They have to be convinced that even though people are quite fond of watercress as a food source, that wherever it's found and sheep are found together, there's a very high risk of the fact that you may encounter a fasciola infection as well. So they have to be disassociated from one another. And apparently that's a very difficult thing to do in some areas because of people's desire to eat um, certain foods that we, we, we can't get them out of the habit of doing. And so as a result, um, fasciolysis is still with us where under ordinary circumstances, given that information, people would naturally avoid the infection by simply changing their eating habits. But in this case, that has not happened yet. If you want to hear more about the association of fasciola hepatica with all kinds of other side effects of the infection, which I didn't mention because they're rare, uh, there's an excellent uh, recent review that I list for you. So the next time we meet, we'll discuss paragonomiasis, an infection caused by paragonomus. Thank you for listening. <laughs>